Hello there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled, Two Crashes in One Day, Ground This Aircraft, the Boeing 727. Two crashes on December 1st, 1974. Now, I remember reading a Time Magazine article about how dangerous this airplane was, and it was having a lot of accidents. And, you know, two accidents in one day. Uh, you know, if that happened today, especially with social media, the outcry would be deafening. Um, yeah, not a good thing. Now, you know, we all we all love the 727. It now has a great reputation, and it was a it was a manly airplane to fly. Even if it was flown by women, it was still it was a great airplane to fly. And I used to say that if God had a desk, he or she would have a model of the 727 on the desk. That that's how that's how good this airplane was. I flew it for 11 years, I think about 5,000 hours or something like that, and thoroughly enjoyed the airplane. Now, the first accident is TWA Flight 514, which controlled flight into the terrain because there was a little confusion on being cleared for the approach and not being on a segment, and I've covered that in another presentation. Now, this one is Northwest Orient. That was the name back then, Northwest Orient Flight 6231. And this was a charter out of JFK um, that left at about 714 Eastern Time in the evening on December 1st. And they were going uh, to go to Buffalo to pick up a football team for a charter. So it's just the three pilots on board. And they took off and they started climbing out. And um, it's kind of interesting because... Passing through 16,000 feet, they got an overspeed warning. And, okay, now, the 727, it'll cruise fast, it'll descend fast, it doesn't climb fast. We would depart out of Denver going west, and the controllers would ask us for ski reports because we were the only ones that were just skimming the mountains on climb out. So, uh, first of all, the first thing is, um, when you're climbing past 16,000 feet and you get an overspeed warning... Yeah, you need to think about that. Uh, Ten seconds later, they got the stick shaker. Okay, now this is confusing. Overspeed and stick shaker. Okay, we should, uh, you know, a lot of times I find fault in the aircraft or other procedures or things like that. These guys, these guys bit the bullet on this one. They This, this was bad airmanship, and I'm sorry to say it, but it was bad airmanship. There's, there's nothing, uh, there's no way to get around that. Um, they leveled at 24,800 feet in a 30 degree nose up attitude. And, uh, they entered into a spin. Okay. They essentially pulled the airplane up into a stall. Now retracing things a little bit. Now during climb out, the airspeed and VVI were continuing to increase. Um, as they got near the top of the climb at 24.8, they were indicating a climb rate of 5,000 feet per minute and an indicated airspeed of 340 knots. And that's just an impossible feat. Um, they got into a, a 30 degree nose up stall and uh, they ended up entering into a spin. Now the accident board determined that both attitude indicators were working properly and, and that they were indicating 30 degrees nose up. Now I can go out to the local airport here at uh, Lake in the Hills and ask a private pilot about pitch and power and they can give me a pretty good explanation. And you know, if things aren't right, you can go to a pitch and power setting, uh, which is how a lot of them are taught to fly the the uh, pattern, you know, you, you establish pitch and power and the airspeed will be kind of where you want it. And that's how you maintain it without, you know, chasing the airspeed, which doesn't work very well. Okay. I digress here. Well, um, like I said, passing 16,000 feet, they got the overspeed warning, um, followed by a stick shaker. And, uh, yeah, they, they should have realized there was a problem there and especially the, the nose up, they got into a spin. Um, they ended up five G's in it. And I don't know of anybody who's ever spun a, uh, a 727 successfully. I don't know anybody who's, uh, been, uh, low enough on the, uh, you know, the Darwin situation to even try it. Uh, but anyway, they got into a spin and they issued a mayday call. Um, they ended up getting uh, 5 G's vertical acceleration during this whole thing. Uh, they called a mayday call that they were out of control when they're passing 20,000 feet. Uh, they're passing through 12,000 feet, and they said they were in a stall. So at that point, they realized probably what was going on. At 3,500 feet, a large portion of the aircraft horizontal stabilizer separated due to the high G forces. And the accident report says, Making recovery impossible. Well, I think they were pretty much doomed uh, before that. Um, in this whole 
scenario, they descended from uh, 24,000 feet roughly down to ground level in 83 seconds. 83 seconds. That's at a descent rate of 17,000 feet per minute. So they were they were really coming out of the sky. And the interesting thing is they had a, a good fuel load of a good load of fuel on the aircraft and there was no fire when they impacted. That was kind of interesting that uh, uh, they hit hard and there was no ignition source and uh, they reported a strong smell of fuel, but uh, there was no fire when they hit. And when they looked at the, uh, the CVR, there was some thought that um, they were uh, exceeding the speed of sound. Okay, come on, guys. Now, um, I, I've heard talk about, oh, the 747 went supersonic. No, the F-102 is a subsonic aircraft. The F-106 is essentially the same design with area rule, and you have to have area rule uh, on an aircraft basically to go supersonic, um, unless unless you've just got more power than God sort of thing. Uh, you can do it in some of the later aircraft, but still you have to incorporate area rule at least to a certain extent um, to get uh, efficient supersonic crews because the drag spike just goes up like that as you approach the speed of sound. Okay, so these guys should have known they weren't going uh, uh, supersonic. So what happened? Well, kind of a basic mistake. They forgot to put the pitot heat on. Now let's look at the overhead panel. This is the overhead panel on the 727. And down in the lower right corner is the uh, pitot heat controls. Okay, here is uh, an expanded view of the, uh, the pitot static system. And part of the co-pilot's uh, procedure here is you turn these switches on, the pitot off light should go off. Okay, well, it could have been, uh, I don't know if this light even existed on this airplane. Maybe somebody knows that. But if the light did exist, okay, you could have had a burned out bulb. You're supposed to press to test these. Uh, you could have, you notice that little bright thing? You could have had the light uh, dimmed because it's dark and dimmed to the point where you really didn't even see it. So there there are, you know, problems here. Uh, there's no... Um, fancy computer system which would have been good in this system to tell you that hey you don't have your pitot heat on and the thing that the co-pilot does is he turns the pitot heat on and he goes through the uh, the uh, check there to make sure that um, you see that little pitot static heat there that you run the little knob through the various um, probes to make sure that you do have it and you got an elevator pitot there that is used uh, for the flight control bellow bellows to give you uh, give the aircraft feel um, so anyway, you'd go through that check. So these guys miss that. And this is some of the wreckage. And this is an unfortunate accident where they, they should have, you know, taken a moment to say, hey, this airplane doesn't perform like this. We're at 30 degrees nose up and we're indicating super high airspeed. Now, I have landed a T-38 at 500 knots. Um... I knew it wasn't doing 500 knots, I could tell, but we have AOA on that aircraft, so that's uh, that's pretty easy to tell. I had hit a something, I forget it was a bird or a bug or something, but it lodged in the, the pitot system, so it was giving me incorrect results. I've also landed, and this is even a better trick for you tail dragger pilots out there, I have landed a Satabra indicating 174 knots, which I think is, uh, you know, it's the same issue with the um, getting a bug in there, and that, of course, you just kind of fly by feel and come in and land. Um, so, anyway... Uh, it's a lesson of pitch and power, and if something doesn't look right, take a second to step back, analyze the situation, and determine what's going on. This was total unnecessary uh, crash, obviously. Um, all three pilots on board, nobody uh, thought to say, hey, this just doesn't make sense. And it was the second crash of a 727 that day in 1974. This aircraft, uh, the 727, had only entered service a few years before. So this is not the way to start getting a bad reputation. You know, Airbus uh, 320, those guys can talk about that too, about uh, getting a bad reputation on a startup. So anyway, that's the tale of this aircraft and pitot heat being left off and icing over the pitot tubes. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Thanks for watching.